Exactly five weeks after the United States women's national team wins the CONCACAF W championship and qualifies not only for the 2023 Women's World Cup, but also the 2024 Olympics, United States women's national team head coach Vlako Andonovsky has named his 23-player roster for the September friendlies. We're here to discuss the biggest names missing from the list, which players surprised us, and the biggest news of all, that Crystal Dunn has been named to the training roster just three months after giving birth. Wow, that's incredible. What a super mom. All of this and more in today's USWNT show. Like this video and subscribe to our YouTube page right now to join the conversation in the chat because we want to hear from you. Hello, everyone. Welcome into the USWNT show. I'm your host, Lisa Roman, alongside lead NWSL and USWNT writer for CBS Sports, Sandra Herrera, and former U.S. international Lori Lindsay. It is so good to be back with both of you ladies. You can join us live on YouTube.com slash Attacking Third, and you can listen to all of the USWNT shows on the Attacking Third podcast. Download and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else that you listen to your podcasts. Lori, Sandra, welcome in. Lori, we've missed you so much. You've been so busy traveling <laughs> the globe, it feels like, covering soccer games. Everyone's heard her on your airwaves and on the stream covering soccer. But Lori, welcome back. How are you? Yeah, good. Great to see you too. And I'm not the only one who's been busy. You too, over here, <laughs> just non-stop talking soccer. So um, good to see your faces. Thanks for having me. I mean, does it get any better than nonstop talking soccer? Sandra, it's good to see you. I saw you Saturday. Our schedule is like a little bit off this week, but how's your Monday going, buddy? <laughs> it's always something. I'll say that. It's always something. But you know what? That's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to, to be living here in this timeline where uh, there is always something to be chatting about when it comes to uh, this side of the ball, right? So uh, happy to be back um, chatting all things USWNT. Let's Let's chat all things roster. Let's go. Uh, yes, let's chat all things roster. We knew it was coming this morning. The United States Women's National Team Twitter teased it on Sunday saying, hey, we have something coming for you Monday morning. And they did. They brought the 23-player roster for the two September friendlies. The United States Women's National Team will be playing against Nigeria. I'm going to run through it. We'll start in the back with our goalkeepers. Three of them added to this roster, Aubrey Kingsbury, Casey Murphy, and Alyssa Nair. Defenders, six listed, Alana Cook, Emily Fox, Naomi Gurma, Sophia Huerta, Kelly O'Hara, and Becky Sauerbrunn. Midfielders, seven, Sam Coffey, Lindsey Horan, Taylor Korniak, Rose Lavelle, Christy Mewis, Ashley Sanchez, and Andy Sullivan. And the forwards on this list, seven, Ashley Hatch, Alex Morgan, Mallory Pugh, Midge Purse, Megan Rapino, Trinity Rodman, and Sophia Smith. Nearly identical to the CONCACAF W Championship roster. All of these players competed in that CONCACAF W Championship. The only name missing from the championship roster to this one is defender Emily Sonnet, who's dealing with a bit of a knock right now. But um, initial reactions, I know some people in our chat right now are hearing this roster and the list of names for the very first time. So welcome in. We want to hear your reactions. Drop them in the chat. But, Lori, I'm going to start with you on this one. You saw the names. You read them perhaps this morning. Now as you hear them again, what is your initial reaction to this nearly carbon copy of the CONCACAF W Championship roster? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I'm not totally surprised. I think this is the route that probably most of us thought um, Black would take. I mean, they performed well. Um, he even mentioned the the what. what qualifiers obviously qualified for the world cup and olympics and um so yeah i mean i thought there was an opportunity that maybe he would start to to mix things up but i also think like looking at you know, these two important games against nigeria to help you kind of can build on what you just did and and keep some of that um um, continuity to the roster and some of the players, like I think of like Taylor Korniak getting another invite in, obviously Sam Coffey, um, who was on like kind of the fringe and then get called in late to qualifiers, um, but now really making the roster. So outside of that, you know, I thought maybe there was potential, but also not totally surprising given these two games versus Nigeria and then, you know, the much anticipated one against England and um, didn't expect to be much change there. So uh, that makes sense to me. I'll be, I think, more curious after these next set of um, of friendlies to see if we start seeing some rotation in names and building out the roster even with more depth, I should say. I think it just sort of falls in line into sort of the 
overall plan? I think when you're looking at the course of the next, what, like eight to 10 months, let's just sort of put that window of timeline uh, ahead of, of having to name a final roster for the 2023 World Cup. Now that they have completed their main objectives this summer, which was, you know, qualifying for the World Cup, winning that tournament, and by winning the CONCACAF W Championship by extension of that, cementing their place in the 2024 Olympic Games and that, uh, you know, Women's Gold Cup competition that will also be taking place in 2024. They, they did all those things. They met all those objectives. So kind of coming out of that, what is going to be the plan? What's the vision for this team looking ahead over the course of those next eight to 10 months? It's probably going to be something like this that's reflective of this roster. It's, it's getting this similar pool of players back together again within certain windows to have more games under their belts as they make this march towards Australia and New Zealand to compete mm -hmm. in that 2023 World Cup. And I think having somebody like Crystal Dunn, you know, back in the mix in terms of just getting into the training camp is important because I think as time goes on, we're going to start seeing more of that as well because there's a ton of players who are still, you know, considered probably the, you know, the usual suspects within this larger pool of USWNT players. And, uh, you know, we'll probably get, you know, a crack at, at getting re uh, reintroduced or reintegrated within the program and within the team as time goes on. So I wasn't too surprised to see lack of movement or, or lack of change or, or any new faces on this roster just sort of coming directly out of the summer that they just had. I think it makes a lot of sense to sort of, you know, continue to, to, to roll with this, uh, with this 20 to 25 player group. Yeah, so these two friendlies that the United States will play against Nigeria. The first one is September 3rd in Kansas City, Kansas at Children's Mercy Park. That's on a Saturday. And then Tuesday, September 6th is the second one. That one will be held at Audi Field in Washington, D.C. We just touched on it a little bit. Some of the players that perhaps aren't on this roster, Emily Sonnet, defender out of Washington Spirit. She's been dealing with a bit of a knock, so that one's not too much of a surprise at all. But there are some of the regulars that are also still unavailable that we've seen be unavailable due to injury or maternity leave. Some of those players in include Katarina Macario, Sam Mewis, Kristen Press, Lynn Williams, Tierna Davidson. Those are players are all injured. Abby Dahlkamper is just returning from an injury, still getting her footing and minutes back under her with her club side in San Diego wave. And then Julie Ertz, Casey Kruger, those players are also on maternity leave. But one player that has been removed from this list of players missing that we've been talking about for so long is Crystal done she's back she gave birth to her son marcel on may 20th and uh from her social media everyone knows that she's been training um on the pitch maybe it's a, a bit of non-contact but getting touches on the ball up until like weeks before she gave birth i am so <laughs> amazed so impressed by her and and she's back in this camp head coach lacko and said that he was excited to get her back that uh she they believe she's going to get time with portland thorns her club team before the end of the year so so uh, with a little bit more evaluation, but she's already ahead of schedule joining this camp. Holy cow. Some other updates. Uh, Katerina Macario is heading to Qatar to go to a special clinic for a little bit of extra rehab for five weeks, said head coach Black and um, not too many other updates on Davidson. She's rehabbing pretty much as is expected at this point. And Lynn Williams will not be back until next year. But when we look at this list and um, some of the players that aren't there, there's also a lot of consistency that we have seen. But in terms of the younger players coming in, this is just a group of friendlies for the United States. And this is a training camp. And we see a player like Crystal Dunn coming into this camp only training. She will not be competing in these friendlies against Nigeria. But this could have been an opportunity for Black Wendonofsky to maybe bring in some other players, get a lot of training and, and time with this national team camp. Are there any names that you would have liked to see on this roster, even if they're just training, not suiting up for these friendlies? Sandra, anyone for you that you wish you saw on this, just give them a chance in training? I don't know about giving them, yeah, like giving them a chance of training, like, um, you know, I'm a little curious now, just sort of like listening to you talk about um, the the missing players, right, who haven't been in, in the mix and how many of them could potentially become those types of players over the course of the next X amount of months. Um, and sort of hearing Adonofsky in the press conference sort of saying how, 
essentially ahead of schedule <laughs> somebody like Crystal Dunn is. Um, and the fact that Macario is going to go and continue some rehab over the course of the next five weeks, uh, it almost sort of gave the impression as if she perhaps might be the, the next player up in terms of potential to return back to play, which would be a madness, quite frankly. Um, yeah, I don't know how you do in ACL and then have like the super strength and powers to, to come back from that and by a very specific uh, timeline. But, you know, I think right now with these particular friendlies, it's in September. I think the pair of them against against Nigeria, I think the I think the perception there is that, hey, maybe this is the time where you call those players in or maybe even mix up the pool even more because we saw that in the timeline of things we actually saw that last year so we saw like post olympics you had this uswnt go on their post olympic tour they had a handful of games that they were going to be uh, participating in and it had all of the olympic olympians who were on the roster and then won the bronze medal but it also had this sprinkling of, of a ton of of players in nwsl who had been using that 2021 regular season to go ahead and really reintroduce themselves to some uh, opposition. So we saw Sophia Smith get back into the mix. We saw Mallory Pugh get back into the mix during those September and October friendlies in 2021. So maybe, hey, why not see something similar this year? I think the reason why we don't see something similar this year is because we're actually a year closer to the World Cup this time. Last year was the window of time to maybe do that and kind of mixing ups and, and get more players in and get this sort of, you know, next gen kind of look uh, to the U.S. women's national team. So I think we're not going to see something or, or like maybe a larger pool once more until, until maybe we get to something like January. Like January is always a time where it's like, let's get a bunch of, let's ID, let's do the ID camps and let's get a bunch of, of different look uh, of players in there. Um, yeah, so that's I'm not the sure. hardiest roster usually that yeah, January. Yeah, I'm not too sure if we're going to yeah. see that. I mean, what would I have liked? Yeah, I would have loved to have seen, you know, somebody like um, like Howell and DeMello from, from Louisville, you know, get called back into the camps. I would have um, loved to have seen, uh, you know, some somebody like me, official, maybe you know, given given a look in, in in some of these camps. But the timeline that is in front of this team, in front of their program, it's just it's just I don't think it's going to happen over the course of the next, like I said, eight to ten months. I think if there are going to be quote unquote new players who are like uh, coming into the mix, it's going to be players who are reintroduced, like those experienced players or the players who are currently out on injury or players out on maternity leave. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that is just, you're exactly right when you think about like the course of the timeline, right? It was much needed. It was very, I mean, Blacko stated that like after the Olympics, right? We're going in a different direction. We've got to get people some experience. Um, we saw that in the She Believes Cup, right? Um, a ton of players getting called in, um, playing in that roster that weren't like some of those veteran players. So, and then th some of those being reintroduced. And now we're seeing, as you mentioned, potentially, or, or not potentially Crystal Dunn, which is super exciting. I mean, I'm right there with both of you with that. I mean, that, I think that's a huge boost that gives depth on, I mean, let's be honest, it could be a depth on any line if we're, if we're being frank. Like you could play in the back, you can play, like you can be in goal if you need to be. Um, however, uh, I think the one one that I'm a little bit shocked that would, or not shocked, but maybe surprised because you're only taking six defenders is a Carson Pickett. Like she got her first, um, she got her first cap, right? Um, and I think it's done really well, true left footed defender. Um, and when you're thinking kind of about depth on that back line, um, yes, obviously crystal fulfills that, that, that role for sure. Um, as she's coming back, but I mean, I thought wouldn't have thought that, um, Carson Pickett has done well in this league to be able to, to potentially get another shot or at least get called into this camp. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the, the conversation always is too. It's like, um, these players are consistently playing on a regular basis, right? Yeah. So it's like now you have these opportunities. You're not under contract anymore. You can bring players in and out. Um, so it's just because you're able to see them on a regular basis, and yes, it's an opportunity to see them at the international level, I just think it depends on what you're looking for and what Blacko is really utilizing this Nigerian two game, Nigeria two versus Nigeria two games um, for, right? Yeah. Um so it's not, I think some people were surprised that maybe there's only six called in defenders too. Um, I'm not totally surprised. I think it gives another option for players like Corniak, coffee to come in. If you're going to keep the roster somewhat um, smaller, 
then it gives those players that you're still wanting to get a, a deeper look at, right? That's a good point to bring up. I do, I am, I am, it does make me curious with like what we saw in July with, with the, the rise of play in somebody like an Emily Fox or mm-hmm. like even a Sophia Huerta on the other side of things. Like, mm-hmm. you know, would you, would this coaching staff humor utilizing Dunn higher up the pitch when yeah. you sort of have these outside backs coming in and providing the depth. And then maybe that does continue to open that window a little bit for somebody like a Carson Pickett. Yeah. 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 I, go ahead. Lee, sorry. Yeah. I think that's completely valid, especially because the midfield for the U S is where there hasn't been that much consistency and depth. I mean, no, there's not that much depth on the back line, but I think there's a little bit more stability there in the players that have come in and done consistently like, like you mentioned, Sandra, with Fox, where it's a, even if Pickett does get called in, but I mean, I, I just want Crystal Dunn higher up the field because like, I just want her to score a bunch of goals, play in the midfield, but that's a position where clearly he's bringing in players like Taylor Korniak and Sam Coffey that ha- don't have that many caps to give them a little bit more experience in, in that midfield run um, because of the depth that's lacking there. Yeah. Uh, so, Someone else, wait, Laura, do you have something about this? Well, I was just going to say that brings up a larger conversation that like, listen, we don't need to get totally into, but I'm curious just a little bit more about like formation wise then, because when we think about the midfield and you have coffee and you have um, also Andy Sullivan in there, like I'm, I'm curious to go with two pivots because both of those players are a bit more like eights, even though they play sixes. So I, I think, and then if you, if, if there is a more solidifying of the spine, and protection there, then, you know, Crystal Dunn, we can see she's going to get up and down the field no matter what, right? She's going to join into the attack. We've seen her do that time and time again in left back position, but then it just opens up for a little bit of a different variation on how she plays if she is in that outback, um, outside back position, because then you have a bit more um, cover in those central areas allow for a bit more of an aggressive play. So to me, it opens up more of an interesting conversation about formation and more about spacing and how you create overloads, regardless of where everyone's playing. I just think it'd be an interesting aspect um, to try in this window, some, some movement in terms of keeping the same personnel, obviously that they have and how do you adjust where that personnel is playing? So you want to see a double pivot perhaps between those two? Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely, I think that locks that down. I think then you can, then you have a variation. I mean, I wouldn't even be opposed to seeing um, a Rose Lavelle playing at the nine sometimes because she's going to drop deep. She played there in Man City some um, when she was there. Like, this isn't, like, foreign, like, concepts, She would almost play similar to how Kat Macario plays in that. Exactly. I mean, obviously, they're different players. But when Kat Mm -hmm. Kat will, I think, most people can agree, and she's healthy, that's her position. I mean, what she brings to the game of soccer in general is we don't see very often, right? But, like, with her being out – then depending on your opponent, there's options to go elsewhere within this personnel. And so I think for me, it's, it's like less about really about the personnel. It's like, how do you move players around? How does it give the team a different look? Because Blacko in one aspect has been really consistent with how he's been calling people in. I mean, he said it and he's brought it. He's, it hasn't changed, right? This has been like pretty yeah. consistent with the way that he has um, put together these rosters and stuff. So well, yeah. I, so I have to ask you about Christy Mewis now because we saw her in the six. Is she going to be part of that pivot? I mean, she could. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I haven't thought that far. Right? I was more thinking Come about on, Lori. Coffee. You're like an assistant coffee. coach. You're our attacking third uh, USWNT yeah. coach. Let's yeah. go. Okay, everybody, let me put my coaching <laughs> hat on. Um, I think ultimately Mewis is going to be better as a higher up player. I think that she can play the final pass. But listen, I think when you're playing two pivots and there's a real understanding of the role. She can play in there with somebody else. I wouldn't right. put her as the lone six. That is something that brings out her best qualities or the way that the U.S. Women's National Team wants to play. Um, and I think we've seen that kind of across the board for a lot of people outside of a Julie Ertz in that regard. Mm-hmm. So um, so if that's the case, she can play one of those double pivots. And then you allow – I mean, we saw that at Houston. This isn't – she dropped deep. I've said this time and time again. She can drop deep and play, play make from that role. And then you just share the responsibilities of the build out and getting into the attack. So – I mean, there's endless options and opportunities for these players, and we will never know until it happens and we see it on the pitch. Um, This United States Women's National Team, of course, getting ready for the two friendlies versus Nigeria, but also in October, the United States will travel to London on Friday, October 7th, to take on the 2022 European Champions England. And 
this is also a roster that Black Wendonofsky is perhaps looking at. When I look at some of these names that are perhaps missing on here, I think one that was talked a little bit about in the media availability is someone like Mia Fischel, who is out of UCLA. She was drafted into the NWSL and chose to go to Mexico to play in Liga MX Femenil with Tigris. Tigris. And this is a player that uh, has been in and out of the U.S. youth pools. Is there any info on Mia Fischel and, and what she's doing with her time there? Is she being looked at? Sandra, I see you've got your jersey on, your kit there. <laughs> uh, join the media availability. Any insider info you can give us on that front? Well, well, first I got to shout out Donald Wine because he was on the call and asked, asked the question specifically about Mia Fischel's little shout out to, to him. But um, I mean, anyone who's paid attention to Liga MX Femenil, especially um, in the recent news where Mia Fischel opted to go and play with with, with Tigres, uh, she's been tearing it up. Basically, that that's what's been happening with Mia Fischel in, in Liga MX Femenil. And I think naturally, when you see a young player, you know, with ties to the uh, you know U twenties or, or or U seventeens or just any youth program out of out of the U S and sort of making that leap to go pro and then being successful, finding success on the pitch, um, I think it's a natural reaction to sort of say like, hey, like let's keep an eye on this player. Let's try to perhaps even take it a step further and get though that that particular player involved in. Uh, in, in camps and trainings and stuff like that. Um, but unfortunately, this isn't going to be a timeline in which we're going to get to see here, which I, I, on one hand, I think is a little bit curious um, because there have been, there has been prior, uh, I think, press conferences where Andonovsky has mentioned me official and saying like, hey, like she's having a lot of success out there. And then you've got this most recent uh, this most recent press conference where he says, actually, we haven't had any recent conversations about, um, you know, getting her into into any sort of uh, near future uh, camps for for the U.S. women's national team. So that that part of it is a little curious for me to yeah. sort of go from from point A all the way to point Z. And I'm like, well, that was very quick. But then I also, you know, I said earlier on this on the episode here, we chatted that there's a certain timeline that I'm, this coaching staff is probably going to to follow leading up to the 2023 World Cup. So this is maybe if this was a year ago, I think maybe you have a similar conversation like this coaching staff was having around a player like Trinity Rodman because they see a very young player. She went on a tear in the NWSL, went on to win Rookie of the Year honors. They're like, let's start getting her into camps. And the idea around Rodman, as this coaching staff has said, that they wanted to work her in slowly with this team, that they didn't want to overload her with too much. And that was very important for the coaching staff to not sort of overload her um, with responsibility, you know, in this uh, on this team. But because of things like players missing, you know, and, and injury, maternity leave, there's been opportunities for these players to get out there and actually get more consistent looks and more call-ins into these camps. And we've seen that with whether it's been a, a Nancy Sanchez or a Trinity Rodman. So I, I'm hopeful that somebody like Ami Official will A, continue to have success, uh, you know, with Tigres, you know, and at the professional level and B, in the mix or at the very least in the conversation of uh, a U.S. women's national team pool. Um, because I think if you're looking and comparing – you know, leagues, yes, Andonovsky is a head coach who's going to keep an eye on NWSL. He's got his background in it. He came, he's a coach who came from NWSL. He's going to look at this league first and foremost in terms of fleshing out a roster. But there's players on this team that are playing on a team like Olympic Lyon in a French division in France. So you can't, you're not going to tell me, this is a Sandra, I feel, same. <laughs> you're not going to tell me that that league is going to be, should be valued more than a league like Liga Mekis Feminil, just because you've got a couple of players who are playing in that league yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a difference, I think, when you're looking at levels of play, when you're looking league to league to league to league. Um, but, you know, official, I think the level, of, the type of player that she is, it, it shouldn't be too surprising that she's gone to Liga Mekis Feminil and then sort of be cutting things up. I, I love Liga Mekis Feminil, but it is a very young league still, still growing. You know, I think we saw in CONCACAF W Championship how there's still another level that some of these players uh, who play throughout the league kind of have to get to. They talked about a lot about that themselves on record. So, um, 
it's an exciting league and it's a very, very fast growing league. Um, so I'm hopeful that uh, she continues to, to be successful and that that success will lead to, you know, future columns. But I don't know if that's going to happen for her in this particular timeline. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with all that. I mean, I think that is like perfectly said in the fact that like this is a player I think certainly should be looked at. And I think that was the thing. And we even talked about it a little bit off air about how, keeping an eye on her, how well she's done leading in the CONCACAF and then um, being like, no, we haven't spoke to her. And so I just kind of thought yeah. that was interesting, at least to keep the, the lines of communication open, because that's a player that um, can score goals, right? I mean, when you're thinking about scoring goals and has performed well, then you're keeping your eye on me official. So, I mean, I think the, the thing with her too is it just goes back to what we've been saying here, which is like, yeah, maybe this is a short period, these next couple months, um, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if she's getting called in um, for some sort of December, January camp to give her yeah. a look. And I, and I understand that that's like not always what like people are pumped to hear. Well, that just no, might be the reality of the situation given the condensed time frame, right? So yeah. I so think speaking of, speaking of people we were calling in, Sandra, hold on. I want to get someone else in on this conversation. We've got Allie Wagner, former U.S. international, joining us here on this hey. combo. Allie, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're calling you in. You're in the jungle. Thanks. I got the call up. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I, I didn't know Who I was are you again? on the roster. Was I, I was the late invite? Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. You are our first You're show. Sure. You're just busy with other camps. Love it, Allie. Welcome in. Uh, talking about the roster, some names that we would have liked to see called in. We, we threw out there Carson Pigger. We're talking a little bit about me official now and what she's been able to do. But some of these younger players that are listed on this, um, Allie, for you, an, initial thoughts on this USWNT roster that dropped this morning? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm surprised. I, I'm glad to see Coffee on there. I, I think she, she's been bright. You know, I think what, what's more interesting to me is the utilization of these players come camp time and who gets the playing time. We've already should, talked should we, about it, Al. We, ah, you did? <laughs> come on. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. We're going to hear. Your, we're gonna hear. I'm just showing no, you. Yeah, hear. Well, I mean, I, I'm sure you're slotting Rapino in to start and, and play all 90 minutes in both games, Laura. Oh, it's exactly what I said. A hundred percent. She hasn't been brought up at all, actually. <laughs> Keep going. We want to hear your point. No, I mean, I just think this is your, I think this is a chance to to give some quality minutes to, to Trinity, Trinity Rodman specifically. Yeah. I think Sam Coffey, absolutely. I mean, if she performs in camp and, and look, there's things that we don't know, right? I, I think back to when Sam Ewis was not playing in Jell Ellis's squad come 2019 World Cup. She was, you know, on the periphery looking from the outside in. And and there was just a lot of murmurings that within the squad, within the camp, that that she was outperforming players and training. And it was quite clear that she needed to get more playing time and meaningful matches. And I just wonder if if those are some similar situations that that are occurring. And and when you think about the evolution of this group, it it, I, I know we're going to – we know we have to balance out the veteran presence and younger presence, but I do think I've been a part of it. When you have some really big personalities in the locker room, it doesn't allow room for some of the younger ones to step up and own their space. And and that is one of my concerns with, um, you know, not Alex Morgan necessarily, but, you know, some of, like, the more – outspoken leaders and they're leaders for a reason, but they also kind of usurp some of the airtime. And I do think that you need to have some of these younger players feel the freedom to express themselves and to be themselves um, in that camp environment. And, and how much is given, how much is earned, you know, we can debate that all day long, but I do think that, that it's time for some of these younger players to, to take on bigger roles. There are a number of younger players called into this, but the roster is um, incredibly similar to what we saw at the CONCACAF W Championship. And as you mentioned, Ali, someone like a Trinity Rodman who really did not see a lot of time in Mexico during that tournament. Um, whereas you look at another player like Mallory Pugh and Sophia Smith, other younger players, Matt Pugh, who has had a lot of caps, though, who saw significant minutes and a lot of time at, at that camp where it balances out. Who are some of the young players that are listed on this roster it, besides Trinity Rodman that you want to see more consistent minutes or maybe who you want to see playing alongside them. For instance, uh, a Sam Coffey. If we see her in the midfield, who do you want to see playing alongside of her? Lori, when you look at, at the midfield unit and, and the people that are jumping into this. 
Well, it's good to see you. Oh, I, you I, to I, I, I didn't. I didn't like what you were gonna have to say, Lisa. <laughs> so. <laughs> Sorry. Um, did, go well. You want to answer that? Did you hear what she asked? Or I had no idea what she said. Okay, I'm, sure, so it was, I'm sure it was intelligent, well said, and spot on. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Gally. Ma major debates. Other other young players that uh, besides yeah. Rodman that you wanted to to see good time. I think Ashley Sanchez needs to continue to be someone that that you you give some quality minutes to. You guys might have talked about that. I just don't know like durability of Rose Lavelle. You know, you there's met a lot of talk and whether or not you can play those two on the pitch at the same time. Probably get squashed in midfield. You know that that's a very real challenge, but I, I also wonder at what point do we switch, you know, systems and do we go to a double pivot? Why is that not something that is being considered if we don't have? Uh, Lori was talking about it. We made Literally, verbatim. That's a direct quote. Lori said, double I pivot. The double pivot. Yeah. yeah, that's it's exactly. It looks like we lost Allie a little bit. Yeah, on that I know one. she keeps freezing a little bit, but uh, when you keep saying, sorry guys, no, you're good. We were just saying we had spoke about that too. I was saying that exact same thing. Like I think the the real for me, it's more of like less about the personnel because we're seeing some consistency in that now with Flacco, and it's more about um, formation change, right? Like how how do you utilize and get the best out of this group? And I think we've seen personally. For me, utilizing just a single pivot with this group and this mix of players it leaves us way too exposed in the spine of the midfield. And um, I think we even saw that glimpses during the the CONCACAF Championship against um, Canada. I think if they had an opportunities to put some in the back of the net, Fleming had tons of space on the outside of Andy at times. And so I also think it suits Andy and Coffee if maybe that you potentially play them together what does that look like? Because reality is they're both more of a number eights than they are true sixes. So I think you share that role. And then, it, and I was telling um, Sandra and Lisa, then it puts players like Sophia Smith and Mal Pugh and whoever you're playing as the number nine. I know we, I even mentioned about Rose Lavelle as the number nine myself and you and I've talked about that before Al, but um, whoever, and maybe Sanchez is the 10, right? Depending on what it looks like, it puts those players in better positions. And then when you want to attack with your outside backs, you have more of an anchor centrally. Um, and I just don't think, I think that has been my biggest concern when we are in possession. And then once we do lose it is being exposed and come, you know, Nigeria can expose it for sure. And also in front of 90,000 fans that come Wembley, they will <laughs> expose it as well. So, they, I mean, we're going to be up against it. I think you're spot on. And, and you do solve for that. If you, if you do switch to double pivot and utilize Rose Lavelle, similarly, the way that, I mean, again, he wanted to build his squad around Kat Macario as that nine. Well, guess what? Rose Lavelle is going to be the closer uh, p possibility to yeah. that then than Alex Morgan and Ashley Hatch then a Trinity Rodman so I think that gets you further down the path in terms of the team being able to understand the principles of play but I also think why are we so set on as much as we're talking about consistency and line up and personnel why are we so set on a 4-3-3 yeah I mean this is modern yeah. football this team should be able to flex in and out of different systems I mean I love what Potter's been doing at Kansas City for instance and the most of these players now are well versed in a three back, are well versed in in you know a four back that then flexes in, into a different look in the attacking half and, and their principles of play that way. So I don't understand why we're not considering different formations based on our opponent and mm -hmm. and getting these. It feels my only fear, not only fear, but my my biggest hesitation with the evolution of this group is is that it's becoming too robotic and that, mm -hmm. and yes, you have to understand space and you have to understand time. And if you can understand those things, then the fluidity evolves differently. If you're telling mm -hmm. people just to make sure that they're picking up or getting into the space at this moment in time, it, it's not what I think some of our players are, or it's limiting some of the creativity of, of some of our attacking talent that we have. Mm -hmm. So I just think that more fluidity, different systems. Again, I know that goes against our theory of more consistency with the lineup, but I think that would help this groove evolve. And to answer another question for you, I want to see Gurma get more time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we will see Gurma. I don't know. For some reason, I do feel like, I mean, she's been playing so well, and I think um, getting her into this mix a bit a bit more often, we'll see that that time come you know i think it's interesting too um and then we can move on <laughs> um but like with the formation or or 
move into a hybrid, right? Like even yeah. if you're even if you start and if your formation is like a four three three or four two three one, what does that look like when you're in possession? Because you can easily move in and out of a three back. And we talk about Crystal Dunn in particular because she's joining back into the mix as a training player, but she's a player that we always talk about. Where's her best position? Well, it does sound like and going off of what Flacco has done in the past and um and what Jill Ellis did, she'll probably most likely be in that outside back as much as anybody wants to see her in the in the midfield, right? But then then you can utilize wait, 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 wait. Do you want to see her in the midfield? Uh I think it's I think with Crystal in on this squad, she's gonna be most utilized and best utilized as an outside back. Yeah. Sure. Okay, good. For sure. I'm glad I'm glad um, we're lying on that. I'm not I'm not lying that I don't dislike her. I mean, I really like I her. I want to see her, her in the Portland. midfield. You do? I want to see Crystal Dunn over in the midfield. Who? Well, yeah, that's the thing. Over who? Because you have Sanchez, the... you have Rose Lavelle, and Nick Macario, if she's back. You well, have we've Rand. already decided we're throwing Rose at the nine. We're going to put Sanchez <laughs> at the ten. This opens up a spot this in the, the back. This is the games to do it, right? Yeah. I mean, if we're talking Listen, about, like, switching it up, like, have, why not? But we have Emily she's, Fox she's only in the back the line. Player. Yes, we have Emily Fox in the back line at this point. Like, I think that the back line is is okay without Dunn. And if they, if Lachmaninovsky can utilize the skill set that Crystal Dunn can provide, she's taken, I mean, what feels like three months only uh, during her pregnancy and since giving birth off, this is a chance to maybe bring her in as a new role and with some of these younger players on this roster, shake things up a little bit. I don't see why not. Yeah. Um, what was my point? Just a second ago. I forget. Um, anyway, you want hybrid, formations, hybrid formations, get people moving. Um, and I think you can utilize different formations within the game, depending um, instead of just having specific structure that you're going with. Right. And then that, that puts people mm -hmm. in different positions to think, think, still bring out the best. So we've I had a got, point. We've now. got, we've got the personnel to do a three, five, two with wing back. So it kind of solves mm -hmm. for it. You've got yeah. done, you've got Foxy. Yep. Um, yeah. I think Sophia Smith, you can play in a two front. Rodman can play in a two front. Obviously Alex Morgan can, that's where she thrived almost um, probably the best in her career up to this point. Minus this year. She's been fantastic. A big thing for me, Ali, I'd love to get your perspective on this because it's like you hit it, right? You said you got the personnel for it, would love to see it. But a big thing that we've been hitting on a little bit in this particular episode with this roster drop and how it's basically identical to what we saw, uh, you know, in terms of the personnel in, in July during the CONCACAF W Championship is what's in front of this team to come. So like this sort of eight to 10 month window and like the concept of like maybe there's just not a lot of time to have this type of like, maybe jarring mix up of, of let's try out these players in different positions or trying out, uh, you know, the potential, you know, for, for different uh, formations. But I think that there's still maybe in this window the, for these two games, like in September, that there is room to do that because looking in front this, there's this game coming up against England in October and then another European side to, to be, determined and announced somewhat soon. I, I guess we'll get that info someday. But I'm curious as to your perspective in terms of like the the, the next steps in, in terms of the limited window of time leading up to the World Cup. Oh, we may have lost. We'll her. never know. We'll, <laughs> we'll never know <laughs> Allie's thoughts on this one. We'll never. We'll never. At least you have her face. Know. You're not the yeah. she's saying it all. She's saying it all with her with her with her face uh, yeah. right now. But I do I do wish that there was that there was maybe the opportunity that we're going to see something against these Nigeria teams because something that we heard about during the Concacaf Championship was like this was the test. These were the teams that were going to be presenting those types of challenges to this to this U.S. squad to these players who were a lot of them participating in a qualifier for the first time, right? Like how were they going to perform against low bunkers or mid blocks, et cetera. So I am curious if, if with this next eight to 10 months, like if we are going to see a dual, like we even talked about like the dual sixes or yeah. like how Alex talked about like, let's do a two front. Let's see this. Let's see that. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if we're, if this coaching staff is going to do that, but I'm, it's it's an important point to bring up that you don't want to out the other side of that adjacent to that you don't want this team to get stagnant like mm -hmm. Ali said like with a good you know point saying that you don't want your attacking players to sort of be uh, operating or navigating on the pitch like like robots you know yeah I think it's a Ellie. great concern 
I, what? Except for the I gave up. With I, a limited I timeline. What's happening with my internet. <laughs> oh, you're frozen again. <laughs> well, we can still hear you though, so keep going. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe not anymore. Or maybe yeah. not. Maybe yeah. not, Allie. We'll, we'll get back to you on that one. Perhaps we'll see a, a rotation because it is such a limited window in between these two friendlies, what they have going. But uh, we hope we have you back here, Allie. But I, you have to window. fire me. You have to fire me. This is like ridiculous. I, I've never had no, no. this uh, occur. You're, you're making it a lot of hard work for the production side of this. It's fine. I, it's fine. I know. I'm so sorry. What I do want to say, though, Sandra, in terms of like the runway leading up to, to the world events that are coming up, I, I do think that that this the margin in which they can experiment is small. And I think it has passes by to a certain extent. So here's here's my my take is that you get your core formation down. I mean, this group has played 4-3-3 for so long. Yep. There's so many of these players that are familiar with each other's tendencies. So you have that in your back pocket. Yeah, is it perfect? No, it's not. You're going to always continue to build upon that. But I do think that they need to to have different looks that the opponent is is, unexpe- is not expecting. I don't know that you roll that out against England, um, but you do <laughs> against Nigeria. And and I think that England match will be one that tells us a lot, right? Yeah. And we're, are we going to have all the personnel available that I think Blanco thinks he's going to have his disposal come World Cup time? No, but um, I think it should be a, a, a really good assessment of which young players can handle the stage and which can't. So I would say if I'm Blanco, I am running out a young squad or a squad that I need to learn about in that match. In these Nigeria matches, I am tinkering a bit. Mm-hmm. and. And, and yeah, I know people won't be happy about it at home because they want consistency. They want, you know, a six nil drubbing, but that's just not the way of, of women's football anymore. So mm-hmm. I think this is your opportunity to test things out. Do I think they're going to do it? Probably not. You know, this yeah. is more going to be about personnel fitting into the system um, and building upon the principles of play that, you know, that they were trying to layer in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just feel I, I agree. I mean, I would like to see I would like to see that throughout, and I think you're making this point through the two Nigeria games and the England game. Just give it I mean, it's it's such an ample opportunity given the fact that we haven't played against that caliber um, for outside of like qualifiers right in the Olympics. We just haven't. I mean, that's been the case. So it's like if you're going rolling out with a young group or you're trying to bring in younger players, then give them the start. Let's see. Get Gurma yeah. in there. Right. Get Rodman in the starting lineup um, or at least coming on fairly early, whether that's at halftime or with ample enough time to like show what she can do off the bench. Right. If you're starting Mal Pugh and Sophia Smith or what that looks like. So, yeah, I'm with you. I think this is an ample opportunity, especially if you're going to be more consistent with the lineup. I think it's a chance for them to show show a little bit more of their creativity too when you give those younger players um, opportunities to problem solve on a pitch against a team like Nigeria that is successful at the international level and that has been to World Cups and can, can show the United States uh, perhaps a little bit something different. But then, of course, England on the horizon in October, that's a big game with a lot of eyeballs and a, a lot of pressure on those young players. But I mean, one game at a time, perhaps one roster at a time, perhaps <laughs> as we chat about this one, um, there, there's definitely a lot to break down in this 23 player roster. Allie, we're glad you got your Wi-Fi figured out, but we, we've been on here <laughs> long enough with all these people. We're happy to chat about it. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining us to chat about this roster. I want to hear final thoughts from all of you on this roster on maybe what you want to see for formationally or against Nigeria or just a goal prediction. You think Sophia Smith is going to go out there and, and run rampant during these friendlies. Final thoughts from you, uh, Sandra, I'll start with you on this one. Final no, thoughts. We better go Ali first. I'm gonna let you go first, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Never. I, I, I got, I got nothing. I'm just getting over and calling the U20 France Japan game. It went oh, that that was overtime penalties. That was wild. VAR calls for penalties on the goalkeeper. Has that ever happened in, in the history? <laughs> okay, of was I was loving it. It was incredibly wild. Poor JP was up to like one thirty. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think, um, I think when you look at this, this, this two match set, uh, this should be an opportunity to take players that are playing really well in the NWSL and, and reward them and test them. And, and it shouldn't necessarily be about getting a veteran presence out there. I would want to see what these players can do without one of the, the mainstays, you know, in that starting lineup. You talk about Rodman coming into a match earlier, not just getting, you know, um, trash minutes at the end of a match is mm-hmm. to be quite frank. 
what about starting her versus coming off the bench? Those are two very different roles. And, and so you've got to start looking at this in terms of, okay, here's the young players that are performing in the NWSL. This is probably one of the last opportunities we can have to just see if, if they're even up for it. And they're going to be under pressure. This is going to be, I would expect, a high, um, high-paced game, a team that can stretch you and show vulnerabilities. So I would be looking at it more from a defensive side and making sure, as you talked about, Lori, that we're solidified down the spine. And are we making the right decisions to not get exposed, let's just say, in mm-hmm. transition, for instance. And, and just little small details, that the boxes should be checked on. That would be like my hope that it comes out of this um, next two game series, that they're they're solidifying some of those decision makings with young players, but giving the young players the opportunity um, to go out and either grab a hold of it or fail. Yeah, I'm with you. I think, uh, I think over the next eight to 10 months, it's only going to be very specific windows of opportunity. And I think that the September friendlies are probably the first of those. I think we got our first answer in that what comes after CONCACAF W Championship now that they checked off all those objectives and it really is looking and feeling like it's going to be about establishing cohesion. It's going to be about along the way reintegrating those players who are going to be coming back from maternity leave and or injury. So this first challenge against these two friendlies against Nigeria will be that rare opportunity perhaps to give those minutes to players who did not get to see a ton of them or create that type of impact during the CONCACAF W championship. And I would love to see it, but I don't know if we will, especially I think if you're having an eye on these two matches and one eye on that match against England, I'm a little bit curious about that. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm right now about seeing this type of roster go up against an England side that went on that incredible run that they did during the Euros. But what does that mean when you're coming out of a a pair of friendlies against uh, Nigeria and then heading over to Europe? So I'm curious to to sort of see the transition from these two matches to the two matches that take place uh, in Europe. And I'm hopeful that we will get to see more time for for Sanchez, more time for Rodman. Yes, of course, I'm hopeful that we'll see more goals from Smith as well. Um, with you in terms of wanting to see these players be given a little bit more freedom, quite frankly, which I don't know if I'm totally convinced that we saw them given a ton of freedom during that CONCACAF champion. So hopefully we get to see that in September and then by extension against England as well. Yeah, I, mean, I just have two things. I think, uh, I think we're all in agreement. And mine would just be like a little bit more play, fluid. Play Rapino more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, it's quite the opposite because if you remember, my point on that was – bringing her in for qualifiers specifically for qualifiers i wasn't saying you start her at the world cup it was like hey if you're gonna have a mix and we're exactly what we're talking about here because now we're having the same conversation which is giving these young players opportunities in games that matter and games that there is is like really solid competition right and my point with the qualifiers was have a good balance in the roster okay so you you took care of business now you have this runway which isn't a lot of time um quite frankly so Mm -hmm. get those players in there i mean we're i think we're all in agreement get these players starting right um i i mean why not have a germa and um um losing names cook um (laughs) center back pairing right in these moments Um, get Sam Coffey, have fluidity and a little bit of how you're going to play. Get Sanchez the minutes we talked about with Rodman, right? Like, I am in full agreement. My whole point about the Pino stuff was going into qualifiers, right? I'm not saying that she should be starting by any means. We have players that are killing it in this league and are going to put a lot of pressure if we get the, I think, the pl- personnel and the way that we're playing under under control or, or solidified that could – still be as amazing group. I mean, these players are going to be so difficult. I think if you're looking at Smith and even a Rosa, Pew. Bell, obviously player Pew going up against that back line mm-hmm. for England in Nigeria. Hell yeah. Like we have yeah. dynamite players just about putting the right mix. And um, I think getting the best uses out of them. And I think that's why we're all sitting here talking about, you know, a bit more of like the fluidity or how you're lining up in the mix of those players, no doubt. So yeah. those are things. solidifying the spine, having a bit of fluidity and like start getting some of these players because those are the players that are going to play significant minutes in the World Cup and we need them and they're dynamite players. 
Yeah. They for sure are. Perhaps we'll see a little bit more player rotation, a little bit more creativity from these young players and freedom for them to play some formational changes. And Allie will never let it go about the comments about it. <laughs> you know, I love it. I love it. I, it. We have, we have no, it, I love it. it. It was only because I said that, you know, maybe they should put her on the coaching staff as opposed to the roster. That, yeah, that's yeah. what oh, I love. I, 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 so. I love that one. I love it. I love it. We keep the banter going nonstop yeah. here. We have some people in the chat saying that Smith is going to get a hat trick. Pew's going to get a hat trick. Becky Sauerbrunn's going to get a hat trick. We, ne we never know what we're going to see from this roster. But Becky Sauerbrunn. I love it. We'll, we'll see if Becky gets one of those. It is fantastic. Thank you so much, Sandra, for joining us. Allie Laurie as well. Allie, glad you got your Wi-Fi figured out. We can check in with your router a little bit later. But everyone, yeah. thank NWSL you NWSL so to the Bay. Yeah. <laughs> to the yeah. bay. Love it. Wrap that shirt for sure. Thank you everyone so much for joining us on YouTube. As a reminder, you can subscribe to us at youtube.com slash attacking third. And you can listen to this episode as a podcast, anywhere podcasts are found, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and you can subscribe, follow us on Twitter at attacking third, TikTok, Instagram, all the places, Allie, Lori, Sandra, thank you so much. We'll be back with so much more on the USWNT and across the world of women's football. Thank you so much. Bye, guys.